Sometimes it's a battle of words. Sometimes it's a battle of wits. Sometimes it's a battle of swords. But there are other kinds of battles. Battles in the name of love, but fought by less than human things or maybe more than them. So we have some battles and we have some vengeance. And this battle and this vengeance is the soul of the third canto that we are going to study today. Hello and welcome everyone to Nibble Pop. Today in this video on the third canto of Alexander Pope's Rape of the Lock, we will be looking at some very important things. First, we will be seeing how Pope presents the whole scene, especially the part about Hampton Court, what goes on there. Then we will come to the extremely beautifully written game of Ombar and I'm going to give you every detail that I can about the rules of the game and how it was played. And I'll tell you that it's going to be very important for you to know the details because that brings out the beauty of Pope's poetry. And finally, the most important episode in this poem, the snipping off of Belinda's lock, that will take place in this canto. So don't miss any single line that I'm going to cover here because I am not going to miss anything at all. It's going to be a long video like any other video in this series. But I know that you will stick with me till the very end because you have all already subscribed to my channel. If you have not, please do so immediately. This is Monami Mukherjee. Thank you all for being with me. In Canto 1, we have seen Belinda getting up in the morning, getting ready, going out to socialize and we have also seen her guardian angel, the sylph Ariel, talking about different kinds of supernatural things. Now, in second canto, we see that Belinda is on a cruise, enjoying herself and Ariel instructs all other selves to take care of her because something bad is going to happen this day. We also meet this character, the Baron, who is seen to pray in front of some altar of love and he prays so that he can obtain the lock of Belinda. This is where we have reached the end of Canto 2. So let's start Canto 3. Close by those meds forever crowned with flowers where Thames with pride surveys his rising towers. Maids means meadows. Usually we use these words in pastoral poetry and this kind of gives off an impression of a pristine landscape where everything is very peaceful and glorious and happening. And Thames, the river is personified here. The river is looking at his own waves because they are rising high and it might also mean the rising towers around him. There stands a structure of majestic frame. Now, Pope is talking about a palatial building, a majestic frame, which from the neighboring Hampton takes its name. So, the name of this building is Hampton Court. It is called Hampton Court because the village nearby is called Hampton. Here, what happens here? Britain's statesmen oft the fall for doom. Because it's a majestic building, it's a royal building. So, Britain's statesmen, politicians and other important people, they come there, you know, they gather around, they have meetings and in those meetings, they have these discussions on what's going to happen to the world because now they are emerging as a colonial power. So, political power of England is pretty important right now. And what do they talk about? of foreign tyrants, you know, they're talking about world politics and just right after that what he says and of nymphs at home. So the discussion is not just about politics but about what's happening at home, the women at home. So Pope is see bringing in two very different elements in the same sentence and this is 
an example of zugma i was talking about zugma earlier where two very different often unrelated things are brought in kind of forced in together by one verb and this is very much similar to metaphysical conceits if you have some idea about metaphysical conceits where very disparate things very different things are brought in together here thou great anna queen an whom three realms obey in 1707 scotland was united with england so it was like this united kingdom was formed and three countries came together and therefore queen anne became the ruler of three realms three countries kingdoms does sometimes counsel take and sometimes tea so she comes to hampton court to you know meet with her advisers and the same time have a cup of tea so again those two very different things are brought in together in the same sentence hither the heroes and the nymphs resort to taste a while the pleasures of a court so this place is not just a political place but like a place of social gathering if you are high society then you go to these places like hampton court and you meet uh, your prospective grooms and brides so it's a place of social gathering in various talk the instructive hours they passed so from this sentence we feel as if they spoke on serious things instructive hours uh, which are very important maybe philosophical matters political matters historical matters matters which you know refine your intellect this is what we think pope is talking about but what is pope actually talking about who gave the ball party so who threw the party that is their discussion so when they meet at hampton court these uh, heroes and nymphs they don't talk about any intellectual thing all they talk about is who gave the ball or paid the visit last one speaks the glory of the british queen maybe somebody talks about the british queen her glory and one describes a charming indian screen and on the other hand somebody is describing a screen a uh, screen is like this curtain like this temporary divider uh, it's very common in india these are the places where we see that the poem becomes like a mirror of society because in those days these things were discussed indian screen because they were coming across these new fascinating things about india about asian countries because they were expanding their territories there a third interprets motions looks and eyes so somebody talks about the queen somebody talks about something else and somebody talks about uh, somebody's looks motions gestures at every word a reputation dies and all that people do is you know gossip about people and that ends up killing people's reputation now a similar kind of a thing is seen in maybe you know sheridan's the school for scandal so scandal mongering gossiping these things were very common during the 18th century especially in these social gatherings snuff or the fan supply each pause of chat and snuff was a very popular habit snuff taking uh, during the times and not just men women too had this habit and the fan that is that was this fashionable thing to carry your fan so all these things are mentioned here to highlight the frivolity the comic shallowness of that society that people who were supposed to engage in intellectual activities they were actually you know wasting away their time in these petty little nonsense things with singing laughing ogling and all that ogling is when you look at somebody interesting you know that is ogling meanwhile so this is the setting of hampton court and this setting will be described even further after this but he says meanwhile declining from the noon of day the sun obliquely shoots his burning ray so this sun keeps on creeping in in the poem in every canto we see the sun mentioned and what is the sun it's a competitor of belinda 
so the sun is you know kind of declining and we know that ariel had come to know that something will happen to belinda before the sun set the hungry judges soon the sentence sign and wretches hang that jurymen may dine people might forget the rape of the lock but these two lines will remain forever you see the judges they are supposed to think about the punishment that they are going to give the sentence that they are going to give but they are so hungry because it's afternoon they don't have time to think about what's going to happen and what is the real crime here how much punishment is justified and they just hurriedly you know, sign the sentence and wretches hang wretch here means the people who are convicted who are tried who are going to prison or going to die by hanging and they hang because the jury men these jury men they are supposed to you know discuss for a long time and decide whether a person is guilty or not they are also very hungry because it's afternoon so all they want is their food their lunch and because of that they simply think that better to just simply call him guilty and do away with it so that person who is convicted is hanged because the jury men are more worried about their lunch the merchant from the exchange returns in peace now this also is like an indicator of the economic boom that was going on in england the merchant is happy uh, he is coming from the stock exchange so it's a business place and the long labors of the toilet sees and this is the time uh, by which the women are ready for partying so their toilet rituals are all uh, over now they have all you know kind of done their makeups belinda now whom thirst of fame invites burns to encounter two adventurous knights we have seen belinda getting ready and in those places we have seen that pope has deliberately placed her in front of us as a military figure you know arming up for a battle so this image is continued when pope is saying that she is burning to attack and conquer two adventurous knights so is she going to fight a battle with them maybe wrestling or sword fighting at omber singly to decide their doom what is omber you might be confused about the whole thing that she's going to fight them at omber now omber is nothing but a card game omber is a card game which belinda loves to play and it was a very popular card game during the time of alexander pope so she burns to encounter two adventurous knights in this game she wants to play cards with them and swells her breast with conquests yet to come she wants to win you know conquests straight the three bands prepare in arms to join each band the number of the sacred nine now i'll ask you to give me 10 minutes and in these 10 minutes i'm going to explain to you as briefly as i can everything that you need to know about this game of omba i'm going to give you the rules which are followed in the game played by belinda so there might be other versions of omba maybe some modern versions too that might not match with this but i'm going to give you the version which was used in this game played by belinda many of you are acquainted with different kinds of card games and many of you have no idea about cards right so i will try to assume that you have no idea about cards so maybe to some of you who know about cards some of my explanations might seem like this is known to everybody but no not everybody knows about cards so i am going to be very very detailed about those things now the first thing which everybody knows is that there are four suits of cards in a deck of card heart spade clubs and diamonds and normally a is called the ace and a is at the top and from there we have king queen knave 
Nev is the J, okay? Gulam in Indian uh, words, we can say. King, Queen, J, and then we have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Not 1, because 1 is S, alright? And normally this is the power position of cards. Now, in different card games, these power positions change. For example, in 29, the J is super powerful and then comes 9, the weirdest game on earth because nothing is logical there. Uh, here in Omber, Ace of Spade is the supreme powerful stuff. Like it's more powerful than anybody else. So what do you mean by powerful? It means that when people play cards, suppose 4 people are playing or 2 people or just 3, they play one card from their hand responding to which other people play other cards. Now, suppose there are three people playing, one person plays a card, then two other people, they are playing their cards. Now, depending on the power position of those cards, it will be decided that which person gets the trick. Okay. So, this is the basic thing about cards. That is why you need to know about the power positions. So, ace of spade under any circumstance will be winning that one trick whenever that is played no matter what cards are played by other people this is done next powerful card is the trump card trump means it is decided before a play starts or a, or a game starts that this suit is a trump suit it can be hearts it can be spade it can be diamond who decides the person who bids the highest. Now, I am not going to those complications. In this poem, we see that Belinda wins the bidding. That is, it is like winning a toss, that kind of a thing. And she decides that spades will be trump. In Omber, what happens? In the other suits, other than spade, the king is all powerful. Then comes the queen. Then comes the J. Then comes the A. And then comes the other cards and in this game 8, 9 and 10 these numbers are taken away first. So, there is no 8, 9, 10. Okay. So, let us just revise the power positions. Spade A is highest. Then comes the 2 of spade, not king of spade, 2 of spade. That is the weird part about Omber and then Ace of clubs. So now with this background knowledge, let us just look at what Pope is trying to tell us. Okay. Three bands prepared in arms to join. So three people are playing and one is Belinda. The second is the Baron who was praying for her lock. And there is this third guy who is anonymous. His name is not given to us. And they play with nine cards each. That is the rule of Omber. So this whole deck of cards that is distributed and each of them get 9 cards and the rest of the cards are placed away. And now the bidding starts, you know, they decide who is going to be the person who will decide the trump cards. Each band the number of the sacred 9. Now, it is a very weird thing to call this a sacred 9 number because it is just a rule that they will all have 9 cards. But when you mention the word 9, two things might come to your mind. One is the number of muses on the Olympus mountain, that is the Greek 9 muses. And the second thing is that line from Macbeth that, you know, tries again to make up 9. I know I keep on mentioning Macbeth and people always comment that too. But yes, that is there. If people uh, recurrently use images from Macbeth, what will I do? I will have to mention that to you as well, right? So, 9 is considered to be very sacred and it has misgivings as well at times and at the same time it can be a very powerful magical number in numerology. It represents you know the spirit of Mars, the spirit of fighting and everything. So, we do not know which sacred he refers to here but of course it is more likely that he is talking about the 9 Greek muses. So, what he is doing is he is Placing in front of us a card game beginning with reference to something very sacred. So, he is going to present to you something very trivial 
in a very glorious light as usual because if Belinda's dressing table can be a temple almost, so can a card game be the battle of Troy. So now Belinda begins to play and after she receives her deck of card, she spreads it in front of her eyes and looks at them. Of course, other people can't see what she is looking at. Soon as she spreads her hand, so this is her hand, the cards which she has got and she spreads them, the nine cards which she has. The aerial guard descend and sit on each important card. Now, important card means the cards which have this power, maybe the ace of spade or you know, ace of clubs, these are powerful cards. Now, because the sales, they overlook the cards. So, their job is to sit on important cards because those cards are going to make her win. First, Ariel perched upon a matador. A matador is the spade ace. This is the all powerful, most powerful card and Belinda has this card in her hand. All right. And Ariel, who is the king of the sylphs here, he decides to sit on this card. And how does a sylph sit on a card? Maybe he's like sitting here like a fly does. Then each according to the rank they bore. So the sylph next in power to Ariel sits on the two of spades because this is the next powerful. Okay. And what comes third? Clubs is very good. You remember. Why were the sylphs following this hierarchy? Why was Ariel sitting on the matador and the person next to him was sitting on the next important card? Because they are very conscious of their positions because women are conscious of their social positions and they transform into sylphs after they die and their pride remains. Okay, that is what it's all about. Behold, four kings in majesty revered. So now Pope is giving you a general description of the cards. We have four majestic kings with hoary whiskers and forky beard and four fair queens whose hands sustain a flower. Now if you look at any queen card, you would see that they are holding a flower. So this is what uh, Pope is talking about. Each sustain a flower. The expressive emblem of their softer power. Four knaves in garb succinct a trusty band. Knaves means J. Alright. So this J comes described here. And then a very important thing is stated. And particular troops a shining train draw forth to combat on the velvet plain. Look at the words he is using. Combat, troop, shining train. Everything is associated with real war and fighting and he uses these heroic glamorous words to describe a battle which is fought on velvet plain. Now what is velvet plain? The card game is played at a table which is covered by some velvet cloth. So triviality is placed side by side with glorified images. So now we are going to look at this reenactment thing again, you know, reenactment of actual wars where actual people kill each other. Belinda has this card, remember, and this is the all powerful card. The point of Omber game is you need to win more than your opponents. Here, three people are playing, but they are not all opponent to each other. There's a team here, and there's a single person here. Belinda is the single person playing and the two people against whom she is playing, they are a team. Okay. And the point is either those two will win or Belinda will win. Under which circumstance will Belinda win? If she wins more tricks than them. Tricks means every time you play a card and other people play in response, either you or they win that trick. That is a trick. So either Belinda will win a trick or they will win a trick and number of tricks will decide who is the winner and in this game she is to decide what is going to be the trump card. The skillful nymph reviews her force with care. The cards which she is holding in her hands they are her force and she sees that she has a lot of spades in her hand. And she has the ace of spades. So if spades become trump, she can win even other people's kings and queens. Because trump cards are more 
powerful. So she declares, let spades be trumps, she said, and trumps they were. Now when Pope uses this sentence, let spades be trumps, and trumps they were, he is not just giving us an information here. He is again reenacting, kind of rephrasing. And what is he rephrasing? He is rephrasing the Bible. And he's telling us that Melinda spoke like God did, you know, God said, let there be light and there was light. So on one level, we can see that Belinda is deified here, turned into a goddess. She's already a goddess for us. And on the other hand, it is belittling this whole phrase. And that is a mighty difficult thing to do for a Catholic at least. The Pope is doing that. And this is remarkable. Now the game starts. Let's play with them, why don't we? Now move to war. This is a war, right? They are for the fight now. Her sable matadors in show-like leaders of the swarthy moors. So the matadors refer to the three most important cards of Omber, which luckily Belinda got. Like she got all three of them. That was her luck. I will refresh your memory. Ace of spade, all important. Two of spade, next important. And ace of clubs. So these are the matadors. And you will notice that all of them are black. And they represent these black forces. And when people talk about black warriors, they talk about African warriors, don't they? So these are the African troops, you know the sable matadors and Belinda is very lucky to have all these three in her hand. Spadilio first. So she begins by this because this is going to win tricks anyway. Spadilio first, unconquerable lord. We know why this card is called unconquerable because nobody can win trick against this. And what happens after this is played? The other two players, they are Supposed to play spades because this is played. So they play, you know, small little cards, maybe some four, six, something like this. And this trick is won by Belinda because she has the ace of spade. I'm keeping it down. And these two are there for the captive trumps. They are trump cards, but they are captured. So they are captive trumps. As many more Manilio forced to yield. This is Manilio, spade two. And when this is played, then maybe they play these cards. And you will ask me that three and five are bigger than two. So why does Belinda win this trick with spade two? Because spade two is the second important card. That is the rule of the game. So this is won by Belinda. So Manilio also wins. Two trumps. So how many spade cards are gone? Three plus three, six. Now because in this game we remove eight, nine and ten and in a suit we have thirteen cards. Thirteen minus three minus six is four. Which means that there are still four spades out in the open. And what happens now? Now Belinda plays the third matador. What is the third matador? Remember this one? Okay. Him Basto followed. This is Basto. That is the ace of clubs. Basto followed. But his fate more hard gained but one trump and one plebeian card. So somebody plays a plebeian card. Maybe a heart too. And somebody plays another spade. So how many spades still left in the board? Or with the players? Three. And Belinda makes a calculation error here or maybe takes a risk here. What does she do? With his broad saber next, the chief in years. So somebody is now coming. I mean, some card is now being played, which is going to be very majestic and serious. And what is majestic if not the king? So Belinda also has the spade king with her. What a day for her. With his broad saber next, a chief in years, the hoary majesty of spade appears. 
So now Belinda plays the spade king. Puts forth one manly leg to sight reveal the rest of his many colored robe concealed. Now normally now we have these you know, two sided pictures in cards. You know you can just simply uh, rotate a card. It won't make a difference. It looks the same. But back then the cards used to be you know unidirectional. So you have this full figure of the king here. You know one of his legs you know stepping out. Uh, that kind of a picture is described here. So when this card is played, the opponent players, if he has a spade, he has to play the spade and he, well, he plays this. This is the knave of spade. So when the king is played, Pope writes here, the rebel knave who dares his prince engage. So when this is played, the knave is played by the opponent and because they belong to the same suit it is as if this knave is rebelling against this king. The rebel knave who dares his prince engage proves the just victim of his royal rage. So he is very angry that you are my knave and you are fighting against me. Okay, let me capture you. Even mighty Pam, what does the third person do? He plays this. This is of no importance in Omber. Okay, but this is a very powerful card when it comes to the game Lu. In the game Lu or Liu, I don't know how it is pronounced. Clubs J is the most powerful card. But poor dear, this is a different game and this card has no power at all in this game. And Pope writes that beautifully here. Even mighty Pam, this is called a Pam in the game of Lu where it is very powerful. Even mighty Pam that kings and queens overthrew and mowed down armies in the fights of Liu. So Liu is that card game where this overthrows all other cards. Sad chance of war, now destitute of aid, now it has no help, no aid. Falls undistinguished by the victor's spade. So this is the victor's spade. He has won not only his own knave but also this Pam who is very powerful in a different card game. So this trick goes to Belinda. <laughs> Thus far both armies to Belinda yield. So, so far four tricks are won by Belinda. Okay. Total nine cards. So there will be nine tricks. So if she wins one more trick that means even if her opponents they win the rest of the tricks even there Belinda is winning. 5 is more than 4. Okay, So her target now is to win one last trick so that she can win the game. But one spade is still there with her opponents. That is the queen of spade. Now to the baron, fate inclines the field. Now it becomes fortunate for the baron. So fate turns the favor to Baron now. His warlike Amazon. Now why is she called an Amazon? Now the Amazon tribe of women, so far as the legend goes, they used to bind up or even cut off their breasts so that they could fight well. So this is a fighting woman. And why am I saying this? Because this now is going to bring a lot of pressure to Belinda. This belongs to the Baron, the opponent. His warlike Amazon, her host invades. So now Belinda plays something against which this will be played by the Baron. And because spade is trump, so whatever Belinda is going to play, she is going to win. And what does Belinda play here? The club's black tyrant. Her first victim died. I'm very sorry, I don't have the king of clubs. I lost it. So I've just improvised on this and made it myself. The club's black tyrant, her first victim died. So the victim of this woman is the tyrant of clubs. And then Pope describes this king of clubs saying that 
what use is your fashionable hair and style and the majestic look if you are falling victim to a woman? Spite of his haughty mien, the barbarous pride, what boots the regal circle on his head? What use is all these things? Because you can't even win against a woman. You can't even win against the queen of spades. The baron wins this trick. And when you win a trick, you get to play. Alright, so this is what happens now. What does the Baron play next? He has to make sure that he wins now. The Baron now, his diamond sports apace. Now this Baron had a lot of important cards in diamond. So he thinks that I am going to play one diamond after another and Belinda will be forced to play her diamonds. He plays the king of diamond. Now you might ask that how can the king be powerful? The ace is powerful. No, I told you that other than spades, no ace is powerful. So he plays this, the baron, and then maybe you know Belinda uh, plays any random diamond, the other person also plays a diamond, and baron wins this trick. So he wins the trick by the king, and then he plays the queen, and that again win some more tricks for the baron. So here he says, the baron now his diamonds pour apace, the embroidered king who shows but half his face, of course a king only shows half his face, so it's written there like that, and his refulgent queen, that is the queen of diamond, that is also played by the baron. So the next two tricks belong to the baron, three tricks to the baron already there we see. Of broken troops and easy conquest find, Clubs, diamonds, hearts in wild disorder scene. Because all spades are gone now, right, from the equation. So nobody can trump the baron. Even if they don't have diamonds, the tricks belong to the baron. And then this wonderful image here. Clubs, diamonds, hearts in wild disorder scene with throngs promiscuous, straw the level green. So the velvety place where it was being played that was probably green and it resembled a war field, green war field where armies were scattered. Thus when dispersed a routed army runs of Asia's troops and Africa's sable sons, sable again repeatedly used here, dark. So now he is bringing these images of African troops, Asian troops, you know, scattering each other, struggling, fighting. With like confusion, different nations fly of various habit and of various dye, various skin colors. They might be from anything and anywhere and they are described here in conjunction with the cards. The pierced battalions, these united fall in heaps on heaps, one fate overwhelms them all. So one fate means all of these cards that were being played after this, they went straight to the baron. In the fourth trick, that is the eighth trick of the game, what happens is the knave of diamonds, he was going on playing diamonds, remember? So after king, queen, he plays the knave of diamonds. And when he plays the knave of diamonds, this one, and wins, oh shameful chance, the queen of hearts. So Belinda had a queen of heart and she had to give this up. Why? Because maybe she is trying to hold on to another card which is even more powerful than this. Thinking that if by chance there is a heart there in the baron's hand, then I can win that back. And because she gives this up, this is the queen of hearts. So, Pope is saying that the knave of diamond is winning the queen of hearts. And Belinda's reaction here. At this, the blood, the virgin's cheek forsook. There was no blood on her face anymore. She was turning pale. A livid paleness spreads over all her look. She sees and trembles at the approaching hill. Now she realizes, I'm going to lose this because my important cards are all going away. Just in the jaws of ruin and Kodil, Kodil is the point where these opponents, they will win. And now, as oft in some distempered state, on one nice trick depends the general fate. Just as in the case of some great war, 
just a trick wins at the end an ace of hearts steps forth the baron plays this card ace is pretty powerful and he prays to god that it will win him the fifth trick but what happens the king unseen lurked in her hand melinda's last card is this the baron plays this what is more powerful this okay and look at the line here this guy he was so sad why because in the last trick this guy had taken his wife away his lover away so he was waiting for revenge lurking okay hiding furtively in belinda's hand locked in her hand and mourned his captive queen he springs to vengeance with an eager pace and falls like thunder on the prostrate ace so imagine the whole scene the velvet plain this is baron's ace and this king angry wanting revenge for his queen slaps on this ace and belinda realizes that she has won the nymph exulting fills with shouts the sky the walls the woods a long canals reply and then some philosophy here o thoughtless mortals ever blind to fate too soon dejected and too soon elate mortals human beings when they win something they get so happy about it that they forget that this can be taken away from them the next moment and this reaction of belinda when she wins this completely goes against the idea of maidenly modesty that usually women are, were supposed to abide by in those days so while we are given this impression that belinda is under the protection of the sylphs and she is a very maidenly girl who is very flirtatious and at the same time doesn't like you know being committed to one person here in this one moment we see her actually not being like a traditional coquet coquettes don't scream and shout in an unmaidenly way when they win something this is pretty masculine on her part sudden these honors shall be snatched away and cursed forever this victorious day so this is the irony of life that right when you are most happy you might be robbed of all your happiness and this is like a premonition for us like a prophecy that's going to be fulfilled right now but before that happens hope brings us back to his 18th century the card game was over the cards were taken away and now they start having coffee for lo the board with cups and spoons is crowned the berries crackle and the mill turns round so that coffee machine and this whole thing is described here and as majestically as the card table was described on shining altars of japan they raise the silver lamp so the table is like this lacquered table of japan and altar that word keeps on recurring it adds to this divinity of this whole place that this is like a ritual which is very serious the fiery spirits blaze so that process of making coffee is described here from silver spouts the grateful liquors glide so the coffee is prepared in the kettle and when you pour anything from the kettle it reaches the cup so that liquid is described as grateful liquor while china's earth receives the smoking tide the hot liquid the coffee is received by cups made of bone china but the grandeur of this description as if it is some heavenly ritual being unfolded in front of your eyes 
At once they gratify their scent and taste and frequent cups prolong the rich repast. Straight hover round the fair her airy band. Now the selves feel that this is the moment when something bad can happen because she is going to drink some coffee and which bad things can happen? She might you know burn her tongue, she might spoil her dress, the coffee might you know, somehow fall on her expensive dress. So the sylphs are trying to predict what bad thing might happen now. Some as she sipped the fuming liquor fans. So some sylphs were trying to cool the coffee down. Maybe she was sipping and they were fanning it. Some over her lap their careful plumes displayed. Some sylphs they were sitting on her lap uh, you know spreading their wings so that if any coffee falls it will fall on their wings. So they were trying to protect Belinda. Trembling and conscious of the rich brocade. Coffee. Now he mentions the drink, coffee, which makes the politician wise, as if the politicians are not wise. And see through all things with his half shut eyes. Politicians look at the world like this. And they are pretty intelligent, but Pope thinks that politicians are only wise when they drink coffee. So if politicians can become wise after drinking coffee, so can the Baron. So now the Baron who had some coffee, he had a plan. Because the intelligence mentioned here is the intelligence for doing some mischief, which the politicians do all the time, don't they? Sent up in vapors to the Baron's brain, new stratagems, he has new ideas, the radiant lock to gain. He wants to get that radiant lock, that beautiful lock, and he has an idea. Hasis, rash youth, desist or it's too late, as if Pope is trying to stop the Baron. Fear the just gods and think of Skyla's fate. Now, Skyla was this woman who had this lover and her father, he was the king, King Nisus. So her lover Minos, who was the enemy, he attacked the kingdom of Nisus. But Skyla betrayed her father. Nisus had a purple hair, one single hair strand in his head which was responsible for his power that protected it was like a magical hair and what Skylar did was she plucked that hair and that led to the defeat of Nisus but interestingly Minos was very disgusted with this treachery what kind of daughter are you and she was transformed into a bird so was her father this is given in Ovid's Metamorphosis and Pope is giving a reference here to that. So think of Skyla's fate, changed to a bird and sent to flit in air. She dearly pays for Nisus's injured hair. Injured means wounded because Nisus's hair was taken away from him. So she is paying for that because she is responsible for that. So think about that. If you are thinking about taking her locks, you might also be punished by that. But when to mischief mortals bend their will, how soon they find fit instruments of ill. When men decide that they are going to do something wrong, they will find any means to do that. Just then, Clarissa, a new person introduced to us without any introduction at all. So there is this other woman who is there, who is very close to this baron, it seems, pretty much likes him a lot possibly, drew with tempting grace, what did she do? She drew with grace, you draw swords right and what does she draw? A two edged weapon from her shining case, now when you use the expression two edged weapon, it's almost like the two edged sword of bible, it is so heavily laden with symbolism here, the two edged, but what Pope really means here is a two-edged thing called a Caesar, which has nothing to do with the Bible, of course. Two-edged weapon from her shining case. So Clarissa, who has her scissors, pair of scissors, she takes out that scissor. So ladies in romance assist their knight, present the spear and arm him for the fight. When a man, when a hero goes for battle, his lover usually helps him get ready, 
uh, you know, gives him, offers him the weapons is going to use. Similarly, Clarissa does this. So, there is a kind of an equation going on there between them we do not know about. He takes the gift with reverence and extends the little engine on his finger's ends. That Caesar looked pretty majestic. I am sure this is like an ordinary one, but this will serve the purpose of the image in front of you. So, the baron takes hold of the scissors and this just behind Belinda's neck he spread. Alright, so he did something like this. And then seeing that the sylphs who were there, they all understood that this is going to be the tragedy today. So, they all come crowded to this spot, all sylphs hovering here. As over the fragrant steam, she bends her head, she is drinking coffee, okay, so she is putting her head down, she does not look here, the scissors are here, the sylphs all rush here. Swift to the lock, a thousand sprites repair, a thousand wings by turns blow back the hair and what the sylphs try to do, they try to blow back the hair and of course, because the sylphs, they do not have any actual impact, they do not have any physical impact, we all know that, they cannot affect anything. So, of course, they simply cannot affect the hair, they cannot blow it back, they try to. So, their action is so desperate and futile at the same time and thrice they twitch the diamond in her ear. So, she was wearing some earrings and they were pulling, tugging her ear so that, you know, she pays attention. But she is oblivious, of course, she can't even feel a thing. Thrice she looked back and thrice the four drew near. So, while drinking coffee, she may be doing this, doing that, looking back and when she was looking back, she was taking the scissors away so that she can't see. So, this was happening three times. Again, three is a magical number here. Now, when this was going on, what did Ariel do? The chief self. Just in that instant, anxious Ariel sought the close recesses of the virgin's thought. Now, the Ariel, he could see things like in the air, in the clouds, in human heart. So, he was looking inside Belinda's heart right now and what does he see there? As on the nosegay in her breast reclined, he watched the ideas rising in her mind. Nosegay is that brooch like thing, sometimes it is like a flower uh, you put here and Ariel was sitting here and he could look inside her heart and what was he looking at? Sudden he viewed in spite of all her art, art means technique. So, Belinda was trying to hide her thoughts even to herself but despite that he saw an earthly lover lurking at her heart. So, there was a guy inside her heart, there was a person about whom Belinda had feelings. We do not know for sure if this person is the baron or some other person that is not referred to here, that is not described here or mentioned here. But an earthly lover, not a self, amazed, confused. He found his power expired because Ariel's power on Belinda, his authority on Belinda depended on her chastity. The moment she fell in love with anybody on earth, she loses her connection with the selves. So now Ariel, he decides it's not my job anymore. Let her just have what she deserves. Resigned to fate and with a sigh retired. We don't know what protection this sylph has given her throughout her life. We don't know. But now, in this most crucial moment when she actually needed some help, Ariel refuses that because she loves somebody. The peer now spreads the glittering forfex wide. So, now this is the glittering forfex which is spread wide by the baron to enclose the lock. I am not going to close my locks here, but you have to imagine this. So, he is enclosing his locks and now joins it to divide. So, now the lock will be gone. Even then, 
before the fatal engine close so this is the fatal engine why because this is a machine and so it's an engine and because it is going to decide the fate of belinda it's going to bring some tragedy so it is fatal earlier too it is referred to as the little engine so he is keeping on using this word before the fatal engine closed so before it closed on her locks a wretched sylph too fondly interposed there was one sylph who was not yet aware that ariel has stopped protecting belinda he was very interested to protect the lock okay and he was so desperate that uh, you know right before this caesar it closed it interfered the sylph came between and what happens when a sylph comes in between and the caesar closes well the sylph divides into two fate urged the shears and cut the sylph in twain so the sylph was cut in two and then what happened because it's made of air it will join again but air is substance soon unites again so this is the funny part you know their attempt to save belinda is futile even their sacrifice is futile they can't even sacrifice themselves and this brings to mind again those battles fought on the plains of heaven in paradise lost where these angels they fight amongst each other and even when they cut off each other's bodies they are united again because angels can't be killed so no matter how much they are hurt they can never be dissolved completely and equating a sylph with that is again bringing to our focus the funniness the weirdness of the battles that are fought in heaven or the battles described in the bible this term fatal engine is again very important because trident in his translation had used the words fatalis machina to refer to the trojan horse the horse that was used by the greeks to fool the trojan people and so this word fatal engine which is like an exact corresponding phrase to fatalis machina this carries with it the element of treachery that this pair of caesars it implies so this fatal engine reference is very important from an exam point of view too because if you don't mention the point about trojan war and trojan horse and this expression by dryden maybe you won't be able to make your examiners very happy so don't forget to mention that point there okay and now the actual moment when this lock is cut the meeting points the sacred hair dissever so when the two edges they come together they dissever they cut the lock from the fair head forever and forever when you cut hair is it gone forever at all so this whole idea of the snipping of the lock as a permanent damage as a damage that makes families fight with each other this whole idea is magnified in front of us calling it as something permanent will make us realize that this is not permanent and then why are we fighting so this was the whole point of writing this poem pope will never tell you here that this is a temporary thing the locks will grow again he will say that this is something that happens like with a lasting impact something which stays on forever and then the reaction of belinda we know whenever belinda is excited be it in happiness or in sadness or sorrow or shock she is not a coquet she is not with this maidenly shyness at all how is she reacting 
Then flashed the living lightning from her eyes. She is very angry. It's like livid lightning. She's like Thor striking down with her lightning. She's like Jupiter and Jove and that kind of a divine figure rising in front of us. And screams of horror rend the frighted skies. Not louder shrieks to pitying heaven are cast when husbands or when lap dogs breathe their last. When husbands die, people scream, that's natural. When lap dogs die, you get sad. And maybe you scream then too. But equating husbands with lap dogs, well, that's a completely unjustified mix, I guess. Husband is a important figure in somebody's life. Lap dogs can be very important figures, especially if you're a dog lover. But then a spouse is like a companion. You cannot equate the two. If you do that, then you're seriously having problems in identifying the priorities of life. And this feeling of considering the dog or the lap dog as a surrogate husband figure. It shows the emptiness of the women's lives during the times. It's almost sad. You can't blame them for it. I was using a very important word deliberately, right? A few moments back, the word is companion. A spouse should be a companion. So when a husband in the 18th century died, women hardly felt any loss of a companion because companionship was something they got from their lab dogs. So of course they would shriek and scream if lab dogs died. So don't take this line at its face value. Don't take this just as uh, a way in which Pope is deriding women, belittling women. He's not. He's belittling the society where Husbands and lap dogs come under the same spectrum in the psyche of woman. He is deriding that society which makes this situation a possibility where lap dogs and husbands are treated equally. So I would rather think that Pope is not blaming women only or rather he is not blaming women at all. He is saying that this society is all horrible because women reach a point where they consider the lap dogs as their real companions. And in Belinda, why is this simile used? To compare with her feelings for her locks. So she screams as if shock had died. She screams as if her husband, if she had a husband, has died. So for Belinda, it's even worse. It's not actually death of any lap dog, but her locks that are gone. All right. So that adds to the humor of it. And of course, there is this Zyugma. I am reminding you again. Breathe their last is that action part. Breathe the verb, which is connecting husbands and lap dogs. So it is a Zyugma. Or when rich china vessels fallen from high in glittering dust and painted fragments lie. Women also scream when their china vessels break. So women also give a lot of importance to these material things like china vessels. And somehow this cracked china vessel or broken china vessel, this image gives the idea of a broken virginity too. Um, and so it has metaphoric value. Okay. So all these things, they make women scream. And here Belinda is screaming when her lock is cut off. And what is the Baron doing? He is very happy. See, I have this lock with me. Let wreaths of triumph now my temples twine. So he's kind of literally putting them across his head. So he's literally showing off his victory. The victor cried, the glorious prize is mine. While fish in streams 
or birds delight in air or in a coach and six the British fair. So, just like uh, a bird delights in the air, it's a very natural thing. So, the women they delight in coach and six. So, he is also making fun of women that women uh, find happiness in these vehicles. As long as Atlantis shall be read, so Atlantis is a novel, uh, kind of a autobiographical novel and it is not considered to be a very good read by uh, literature enthusiasts, uh, very bad quality uh, with sexual intrigues and everything. So, it is a popular novel of the times and the uh, parent thinks that this novel is going to have everlasting fame. So, as long as Atlantis is going to be read, so he is speaking like Shakespeare did, you know, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, that kind of a sentiment is evoked here. And this is also uh, seen in Virgil's eclogues translated by Dryden and the lines are like wild savage boars delight in shady woods and finny fish inhabit in the floods and so on. Uh, Pope's uh, pastorals there also he writes these lines uh, while plants their shade or flowers in their odors give thy name thy honor and thy praise shall live. So, this is a popular trope so long as this happens this will happen. So, it is an attack on that popular style of writing poetry which Pope himself wrote. So, that is the beauty of it that Pope is sometimes going against his own style and that is the honesty of a satirist that he will not back down even when he sees that his satire is a ridicule against himself because he knows that honest satire can satirize one's own self too. As long as Atlantis shall be read on the small pillow grace a lady's bed while visits shall be paid on solemn days when numerous wax lights in bright order blaze while nymphs take treats. So, when parties are given so long as this happens so long as society mingles with each other and assignations give so long my honor name and praise shall live. What has he done? What has he achieved? He has snipped off a pair of lock and not even a pair one of the pairs and he calls that an achievement because if we take Pope's glorification of the whole thing that has been happening here as serious if we actually believe literally in the way Pope has presented the whole episode then this is an achievement but this whole thing was a hoax it's like a prank and this is a bad prank. Imagine your friend stripping off your lock of hair. You won't even call it a prank. It's a sad cruel thing and it's not a way to actually hit at somebody and you don't possess somebody's lock by you know, cutting it off and putting it on your head. You don't do that. And then more philosophy. What time would spare from steel receives its date. So, Belinda's lock was time proof. Time proof means she took care of it so much that even if she turned old, she would have dyed it and kept it evergreen, I mean ever black or ever golden. But steel was responsible for its fall. And monuments like men submit to fate. Steel could the labor of the gods destroy. Now, steel is something you use in a versatile way. You use it in scissors, in swords, in shields. Okay. So, when I say that steel is responsible for the greatest wars the gods have fought, yes, they are responsible for the victories and the loss, yes. But not the steel which is making up my little pair of scissors, right? So, this is what Pope is doing here. He is finally equating this trivial object with the mightiest weapons simply because both are made of steel. Steel could the labor of the gods destroy and strike to dust the imperial towers of Troy. Steel could the works of mortal pride confound. We know about temples and structures that were destroyed by invading troops who carried swords 
and other weapons made of steel. So, all monuments are, were destroyed because of steel. And hew triumphal arches to the ground. What wonder then, fair nymph, thy hairs should feel the conquering force of unresisted steel. So, no wonder the steel which is responsible for this widespread destruction of so much of human civilization will be the reason for your tragedy as well. There is no surprise there at all. So, Pope here ends the third canto, the fourth canto and the fifth canto, they will be the after effects. What happens now? How does Belinda react? What becomes the conclusion of the poem? I had promised you that I will be taking you through this whole first three cantos and maybe I will take a break before I go on to the final two cantos. Uh, why don't you read that up yourself and if you find that you have not understood something you can always come back to me and well if I see many of you requesting maybe I will think about doing the last remaining cantos as well. But I think if you have seriously watched these uh, videos of this series up to uh, canto 3, then you are pretty much oriented to understand the basic ideas that Pope wants to communicate to us. What I will do first is I will make videos on the character of Belinda, the way 18th century society is represented in the poem and the supernatural machineries as we see in this poem and maybe also why it is a mock epic. So, either I will make separate videos on them or I will just you know put all these questions into one video, uh, but I will make that so that you have some idea as to how we are going to attempt these long questions, which points you need to focus on, how we are going to structure your answers. I will also advise you to go and read up uh, the answer which I have written on uh, Belinda's character. I will give the links in the description as usual. If you have any problem regarding this canto or the previous cantos, feel free to ask them in the comment section. Sometimes I am able to fulfill your demands and requests. I am really sorry if I cannot address all your issues together and make videos on all the topics that you want me to. I am just one single person and my editor he is also just one single person. So, both of us we are trying real hard to meet all your expectations, uh, but we are only human beings. I am really overwhelmed by the kind of response I have seen and really I am very thankful for your support. It's a festive season and I wish you a wonderful Diwali. I hope you have lots of fun and stay away from that book for at least a couple of days. It will make you feel even better about coming back. So I end this video with lots of love and Diwali greetings to all your lovely children out there. This is Monami Mukherjee signing off. Stay happy, stay safe. Bye-bye.